Um, so the hacker ethics says that um, you should judge a hacker by his hacks, not by his gender, by its race, by its appearance, other superfluous things. And this is something that we take very seriously at the CCC. And so um, this talk is somewhat in that direction that we, at the first camp, well, we started to say, okay, we want to enlarge our cultural space. So we want to integrate artists, we want to integrate political activists, people who need our help. And so this camp has been, as a kind of unofficial topic, also about remembering that. So remembering that the hacker community is a community that has special abilities, um, special talents, and that we have a responsibility uh, to use these talents wisely. And so we have come a long way doing that, um, basically making our community more accessible. But one of the spots that we, where we are still a bit lacking uh, is making women an integral part of our community and uh, making them feel welcome, um, making them not feel repelled by all this, this hacker stuff. <laughs> And so, in order to learn about it, uh, we invited Fiona to talk about a woman in tech in general and technology fields, uh, to learn a bit more and to find ways uh, how we can improve in a very non-ideologic way, just doing the hacker way, finding solutions to problems that we all can live with. So, welcome Fiona. Well, thanks a lot for the introduction and welcome to this talk about women in tech. Um, I'm really, really ha uh, happy and grateful that I can talk about this topic that is obviously kind of important to me, but I also think it's not really a given that we can talk about this topic because especially recently, I feel like the dis public discussion has been somewhat heated up from all kinds of directions and often, um, oh, there's an ant crawling into my computer. Um, and often, especially recently, I feel like it has been dominated by accusation and conflict, where I think that collaboration explanation are key to improve the situation. So I'm really happy that you're here and that I have the chance to share the insights that I have um, gathered over the last couple of years. So um, a couple of words about my background. I just got into tech a couple of years ago, and since then I've been a strong advocate of um, so-called digital literacy. So I've been uh, involved in various projects that are aiming at making um, knowledge about technology more accessible and encouraging people to get into technology. And um, one of those projects were the Chaos Mentors. Some of you might know it. It's a program um, aimed at people visiting Congress for the very first time, uh, the Chaos Communication Congress by the Chaos Computer Club, and also encouraging people to visit the Congress. Now we'll delve into those um, experiences uh, from time to time. Um, yeah, so uh, my, the results that I'm presenting today are mainly, uh, mainly based on the experience that I've made over the last years in exchange with initiatives that are also aiming at onboarding women into technology, but also from talking a lot with women that are detached or attached to technology, and also about some research that I conducted over the past six months to dive deeper into the scientific resources that there are existent about women in technology. So um, I kindly ask you to understand that I'm using a lot of uh, binary explanations today talking about women. I do understand that women are not a homogeneous kind of group, but I kindly ask you to understand this for pragmatic reasons so that we can solve an existing problem. Um, yeah, let's skip the small talk and go directly to this uh, very German tradition of expectation management, what I'm going to expect today from this talk. Um, today I will talk with you a little bit about the existing challenges that there are for women, just so that we all get to a basic knowledge about um, yeah, what challenges they have, and also how we can solve this together as a community, because I think most of us are at least... Um, involved in tech or even key figures in our communities. And uh, we will think about how we can change the situation together. And um, thirdly, I will talk about the reasons why we should care at all, because I feel like this is a point that has been somewhat often neglected in the discussion, but I think it's super important to talk about this so we can motivate more people to get involved. 
And also, if there's time left, we might talk about a little bit um, about existing initiatives, but we'll see whether there will be time left. So um, let's go to zero first. No women in tech. Um, what is the current situation? And I could um, bore you forever with statistics and studies and research about the uh, distribution of women in computer science and technical jobs and occupations, startups, companies. Um, but I won't do this because I think every one of us knows this fairly well from their own everyday life. Um, a lot of us are part of technical communities. We've been visiting conferences. We are part of open source development. And we know this from our everyday life that there are are only few women in tech. There are women in tech, of course, and sometimes it's just a very normal thing, but usually they are in a minority. And there are different explanations for this, why that is. One of them I want to present to you, um, I found it particularly interesting, is um, it, I read it on the blog of the Planet Money podcast, and they um, talked about um, there's this particular point in history where the number of women studying computer science uh, started to dwindle, and that was in the middle of the 80s. Maybe some of you have an idea why that is. And their theory is uh, kind of interesting. They say that there was the start of the distribution of the personal computer in people's homes. It became a product that was advertised. And um, I warmly invite you to check out some old Apple uh, spots about the personal computer being uh, about the computer being in people's homes and how little Jimmy can become an astronaut because he has a Mac uh, computer and it seems totally reasonable. And because it came, it became a product and was aggressively advertised for uh, boys. And the computer started to be something um, normal or rather usual in boys' uh, um, bedrooms. It made, it created at a very early stage. Um, a gap or an experience gap for girls in school. So when they would, they would enter school or elementary school, they would already have um, far less exposure to computers than boys would have. And this, of course, creates a leaky pipeline where girls wouldn't be um, able to compete as good um, in school, and this continues and carries on. So this is just one explanation, and um, it leads us very quickly to the next point of the challenges um, and um, I put down the title of this report, Why Are There So Few Female uh, Computer Scientists in, uh, by Alan Spurtis. It was written in 1991, and I'm really fond of this uh, report. It was written uh, by uh, a computer science student, Alan Spurtis, who's now a professor in computer science at MIT. And she was basically just wondering, because she was always interested in technology and didn't understand why she was one in few people, a uh, few women studying computer scientists, uh, science. And her report is very, very accessible to everybody uh, who hasn't been exposed to feminist literature for 10 years. It's very easy uh, to understand and offers basic explanations of almost every single point that was further elaborated in uh, research in the following 30 years. And it's also... Um, uh, free to download on the web. So the first thing that I want to talk to you about are stereotypes. Stereotypes are not necessarily immediately something super evil. Actually, they're really helpful for us. They help us to um, categorize our environment, to process all the millions of um, images and uh, impact that we are... Um, um, million of... Uh, things that we are seeing that we have to grasp and progress. Um, but stereotypes always, you have to keep in mind that um, stereotypes never come alone. They always go hand in hand with some attributions that we ascribe to a group. And what kind of traits we ascribe to people is always dependent on the cultural context that we live in. So um, stereotypes and where we connect with them is always constructed. And we do not only ascribe things, we also start um, to expect things from people that belong to a certain group. And, um, for example, we might expect uh, girls not to be good at math. Um, and when we start, or, uh, yeah, we might, um, yeah, for example. And um, those things are quite powerful. Um, they can even make people perform in a different way. And this is called stereotype threat. So 
when you might have heard of the term self-fulfilling prophecy, and it sounds way more esoteric than it actually is. It's actually um, based on a lot of research in social psychology about the term stereotype threat or the phenomenon that means that people also live up to the expectations that are put on them. And um, so chances are good when a girl is being taught um, her entire childhood that girls usually suck at math, chances are good that she will have problems in math. And also this goes even further. If a person that has, uh, for example, darker skin or a certain migration background and grows up in a context where this migration background or people with this background are expected to be criminal or less intelligent, chances are very bad that this person will experience trans equality. So when our stereotypes um, limit the possibilities that other people have, we call this um, prejudice. And if those stereotypes make people perform less well um, in a task, uh, we call the stereotype threat. And I think one of the most impressive examples for this comes from a study from 1999 when um, uh, three groups of uh, women that are studied, were studying math and had an Asian migration background were asked to perform on a math test. And they were all expected to perform more or less equally well. And the first group only had to claim their migration background. The second one didn't have to claim anything at all. The third one only claimed their gender. And the third one performed way above what was expected. And the third one that only gave, um, mentioned their gender were performed way below what they were expected to perform as. So simply rem reminding people of the stereotypes that they have or the traits can have a significant effect on the um, on their performance on a task. So, in our context, there's not only um, this kind of stereotype that is very powerful, that women can't program or are bad at math, um, there's also another stereotype about the programmer uh, being this male person um, tinkering in its cellar. So, a second problem, um, so, just to, uh, um, to to explain it again, stereotypes, we all have them, and um, they are very, very powerful in affecting us, how we see each other, and how, so how we behave. A second problem that I came across personally a lot, and that everybody I talk to who's working in initiatives also comes across is self-confidence. Um, women tend to evaluate their own abilities and performance way below the way they are actually performing. And um, this has posed or has turned out to be one of the biggest challenges also for me in working with women, that they, they don't perform less well, they just think they can't do stuff. And I think it's not only evaluating their own performance and abilities, it's also about whether they feel comfortable going somewhere, whether they feel appropriate going somewhere, especially with the chaos mentors. Um, I've been experiencing this a lot, that... Um, so the Chaos Mentors, we get about um, 100 or 120 uh, mentees each year. And last year, we had about 50% female mentees. And a lot of them write me emails and they say, yeah, uh, hi, I'm, uh, I, I've been totally fascinated with computers. I study uh, math. I'm doing my PhD in biochemistry, but I don't know whether I belong on the Congress. So they often feel not appropriate or not immediately belonging to a certain community. As, uh, when it's tech-related. And um, the next problems are kind of uh, related to structural problems, meaning they're already deeply embedded in our society. There's family planning that women get pregnant or they take care of their family or older people um, or their parents when in critical years when they actually have the chance to have another push to their career or women are usually more, um, more ignited to... Uh, move together with a partner somewhere else. And also, of course, deeply um, intertwined with the point stereotypes, the lack of positive role models um, affects a lot. Uh, uh, the, like, I mean, take any random cultural reference to hackers, it's chances are good that this reference is male. And also, of course, environment. Um, when a community or a job, um, um, uh, an office or a group is male-dominated, it doesn't mean that this group is um, deliberately being 
uh, hostile towards women, but it can be that the conference is taking more into advantage um, or into consideration the needs and interests of men just because they are the majority. So, as Frank said, we are going to choose the hacker approach and not delve into the problems too long, but think about how we can solve this issue. And I put together some solutions that I've gathered um, over the last couple of years. And they might sound really, really simple, but I'm often surprised that they're still not being um, followed, um, considering how simple they are. So the first one is be explicit and inviting. And this might seem really, really simple, but if you are organizing a conference, if you are leading a group, if you want women to come to be part of your community, why not say it? Be explicit. You have to um, invite women for them to actually feel welcomed. Because at the Chaos Mentors, for example, um, a lot of people told us that just alone the fact that they knew oh, the CCC is having a program that is explicitly aimed at making a landscape more diverse and explicitly aimed at onboarding women, already took for them away such a kind of a default mindset of not being welcomed. And it helped them a lot, and a lot of them told us that this was the only reason they even attended, knowing that we are um, caring about this kind of stuff. So um, communicating that you're caring about this issue is key. And secondly, um, role models. Of course, women being on stage is a super important thing. And um, manipulating the narrative that is dominant, that there are only male hackers, showing that there are female hackers. Um, and women on stage is a super great thing. Um, but we also, it's not the only thing that we should care about. It's also about this women being in a hacker space and it's completely normal, it's not a big deal. Um, and I think that sometimes this is even more important. So whenever you have the chance to represent your hacker space, to talk about it, always keep in mind that there are also women. Because if you don't, chances are good that people will assume that there aren't any. And also talking about this issue. Um, so this is a very good start. Um, but also getting into exchange with other initiatives that have been working in this field already that have gathered some knowledge about this. Also talk to your fellow male colleagues or partners and friends about this. And of course, to the women. Ask them maybe just, um, hey, do you feel comfortable at all? Is there something that bothers you? I know it seems very simple, but <laughs> I wonder if uh, everybody in this room has already thought about this. Um, just showing your uh, awareness for this kind of issue already is a huge step. Um, and also, of course, talking about this publicly is important. Um, creating spaces for women. Um, I know that this is a somewhat difficult thing, and this has been discussed a lot recently, but I think, um, and I've also been kind of a skeptic towards this because, hey, doesn't this reproduce all the prejudices that we have, that women need extra um, treatment and spaces? But in the end, it just solves the problem that women might not feel comfortable going to a space where um, uh, they don't feel uh, like they're explicitly invited or maybe they just feel more comfortable amid women when women explain something to them. Um, so if you are uh, in a hacker space and heard when or active, engaged, in your hometown or city or neighborhood. Just think about organizing a women's workshop, for example. You'd be surprised. There will be women that you've never seen before, most likely. And also those spaces for women don't need to be physically. It also helps a lot if women can connect to each other. Because even if there is a, a study class where there are a lot of women, um, sometimes they have the problem that they don't really um, that they are still isolated because they are still separated from each other. And um, connecting women with each other has proved to be super helpful, especially in universities and institutes. Um, yeah, and last but not least, more women in tech will lead to more women in tech. So it um, might sound absurd, but I think the more effort that we put in it, um, and the more women that are going to be in tech, the more this development will accelerate. And I think, and I also believe that this was usually helps also to make the landscape all in all generally more diverse. So why should we care at all? Um, I think one of the main reasons is fairness. 
It's not about, um, I mean, if somebody doesn't want to learn programming, that's totally fine. I can totally understand. If somebody doesn't want to get into computers, it's also totally fine. But if somebody wants to, we should give them equal opportunities to enjoy technology, just as we do. And this is about fairness. Diversity in communities. The broader we are, the more powerful we are. The more perspectives we are, the more we have, uh, the more possibilities we have to react. And um, more po uh, diverse perspectives usually make us more um, uh, capable of dealing with different challenges. And thirdly, what I personally think is most important is diversity in technology. Our lives, and not only our lives, but everybody's lives on this planet, is being vastly dependent and affected by technology. And we should ponder about whether this technology shaping our lives and everybody else's should be created by a relatively small percentage of this planet's popular, uh, population. And um, if we want to use technology for different interests, challenges, then different people with different perspectives need to get involved. And I don't think that only women code differently. I think everybody codes differently, and everybody has different challenges in their mind, different perspectives, and a different set of awareness. And um, yeah, I think in order to use technology for different kind of needs and interests, we need different people. So I um, briefly just wanted to talk about what initiatives they are, but I think, yeah, since we have only limited time, how much time do we have left? Yes, I will give this talk 10 minutes in the, in minutes. At the end. Okay, maybe I don't even need that much time, but yeah. Um, so this, for example, I was talking about this um, connecting women to each other, the, um, um, yeah, maybe, maybe I skip this right away and go to the rail skirts. Um, or, yeah, well, let's go to the rail skirts right away. Um, are there rail skirts people in this room? Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much for your work. <laughs> Talk to the raid skirts. They know best what to do. Because um, the raid skirts, uh, I think they were founded in Finland, have been active in Berlin, where I come from, from for uh, several years. And um, in case you've got too much money, just give it to the raid skirts, because I guarantee you they have a huge impact. Um, I know people that have been doing their first, so raid skirts, they do beginner's workshops for, um, in Ruby on Raids, the framework, uh, Ruby framework. Um, and they invite a lot of women, maybe about, I think 60 or 70 go to one workshop. They have, uh, about 40 mentors that are helping them out for one day to, um, actually create an app by themselves. And I know, um, and they have a very sustainable model in Berlin as well, where they join learning groups afterwards right away and actually um, work on a program um, or a project. And I know some people that have been doing their first ever programming workshop um, two years ago afterwards went into half time, worked their butt off, and now they're working as developers. And um, after simply two years, they quit their job, work as developers, earn probably four times of the wage that they've earned before. And so it's a super, super um, effective thing. And I think it's not about uh, the income itself, but it's also about women getting into technology and gradually changing the perspective that there is. Um, yeah. And there's also one interesting thing. There's this uh, computer science class at the Hochschule für Technik und Wirtschaft in Berlin, and they have the first ever women's computer science class, which sounded bewildering to me at first, but then I talked to them and it's solving so many problems. And actually they're solving so many problems that I think, hey, why don't you stretch this out to many other computer science classes? For example, having um, hours that are, uh, or studying hours that are family friendly. Um, yeah, but this just briefly. But I think much more important than other initiatives uh, it's the fact that we are here. So I think that every one of us has a huge leverage in the hand to change things in our hacker spaces, in our uh, family, amid our friends, and also in our study classes and companies. And um, I think 
from, so from my research that I've been conducting, there's this one thing that I learned, that um, all the challenges, and you might have noticed this, all the challenges that there are for women are so deeply intertwined that every little solution and little step forward will affect so many different things. Um, so your little steps and uh, your little support for initiatives and changing people's mindset would change a lot. And um, yeah, in the end, make this community more diverse and even more pleasant for everybody to attend. So thanks a lot for your attention. And um, stay here after the talk. There will be the chance in a self-organized session to exchange even more. Thanks a lot.